This is the third film in a series of four parts, which is aimed at looking at prevention of hospital acquired thrombosis. Um, my name is Rebecca Locke, and I am an anticoagulant nurse specialist who's been working in this area for over 25 years. And I'm Carol Law, and I'm a thrombosis education advisor, and I've been delivering courses in anticoagulation, thrombosis and thrombosis prevention with Rebecca for over 20 years. We're delighted to be presenting this short film focusing on the prevention of hospital acquired thrombosis on behalf of Thrombosis UK and the National Nursing and Midwifery Network for VTE prevention. Before we start pre discussing the prevention of hospital acquired thrombosis or HAT as it is sometimes referred to, we need to define what hospital acquired thrombosis is. NICE, the National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence, says it covers all venous thromboembolism that occurs within, in hospital or within 90 days after a hospital admission. So why are we concerned about HAT, hospital acquired thrombosis, and why is thromboprophylaxis, which means implementing strategies to prevent thrombosis, important? Well, HAT is a common and potentially preventable problem. And about one in four people die from causes related to a blood clot. And as you can see on the slide, 55 to 60% of VTE cases occur during or following hospitalization. It's also the leading cause of preventable death in hospitals. And in addition to this, it has long-term consequences that are expensive for both the patient and the health service. So if we don't prevent VTE while someone is in hospital, it can have serious consequences for the patient. And as we've previously discussed, these can include fatal pulmonary embolism, PE, so somebody can die as a result of, of having a, a, a DVT and PE. If you've had a, a VTE event, then you can have another one. So you're much more likely to develop another DVT or PE. You can also develop post-thrombotic syndrome, which is often referred to as PTS, and as a result of that, develop venous ulcers. And if you've had a PE, you can also go on to develop chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, which is a life-limiting respiratory condition. And people can also have a reduced quality of life and it can have a huge psychological impact. So we can see that it can have a lot big, it'd be expensive for the patient and also be expensive for the NHS and social and social care. So one of the problems and challenges is that VTE is frequently unrecognized. And we often talk about VTE as being like an iceberg because some of it is hidden. And unless people understand the symptoms of VTE, they don't present in hospital. Staff also need to recognise the signs of VTE in order to make sure it's diagnosed and it can be mistaken for other conditions. So maybe somebody who has a pulmonary embolism may be misdiagnosed with having a chest infection. And also it can be asymptomatic so that only people with symptoms present to us in the healthcare system. So they are the ones that come above the waterline, the tip of the iceberg that we can see. And, and it's estimated that about 20% of the, of the cases are actually seen, so above the water, but about 80% lie below the water. So what we need to do is to make sure that we find all those people that are at risk of VTE whilst in hospital, so we don't miss any of those 80% under the water. So we're going to discuss how we can do this in four steps. So we're going to think about risk assessment and risking, risk assessing all people who come into hospital, reassessing that risk while people are in hospital when their clinical condition changes. We're going to think about how we provide appropriate thromboprophylaxis for people who are at risk and, and the need to provide written and verbal information on admission and on discharge. So Rebecca's going to start taking us through those steps now.
Most hospitals since 2010 have introduced a VT risk assessment. In this slide, you can see the, the national tool. However, there are other variations. So it's good for you to acquaint yourself with the one that your trust uses. It can be electronic or paper based, um, and it's usually part of the clerking procedure. The top section um, looks at identifying if a patient is potentially at risk due to the lack of mobility. All surgical and all medical patients who have significantly reduced mobility should be considered for risk assessment. The middle section, or step two as it's called, is a review of the risk factors for VTA. Now, a patient may have more than one risk factor, and that can be ticked. However, if they just have one tick in one box, they need to have thromboprophylaxis, and that should be given according to NICE guidelines. So step one of the risk assessment we've looked at, once VTE risk has been established, um, we need to reassess for bleeding. And at the bottom of that national tool, you can see that there is a section to look at patients' risk of bleeding. They may have more than one risk for bleeding. And um, if, they, if bleeding risk is identified, it's very important that a clinical decision comparing the risks of both bleeding and clotting is made to assess what is the best course of action. Remember that VT risk assessment may need to occur more than once during a patient's journey. So step two, re reassessment of risk. NICE says all medical, surgical and trauma patients should be reassessed for risk of VT and bleeding at the point of consultant review or if their cl clinical condition changes. For example, if bleeding stops or if it starts, if mobility decreases or if they become dehydrated, um, uh, or if they're undergoing a procedure with a high risk of bleeding, or if they're transferred to ITU. There are two methods of, um, that can be employed for thromboprophylaxis. So once one has decided that the patient needs thromboprophylaxis because they're at risk, then a choice will be made between chemical thromboprophylaxis, pharmacological, which is basically clot prevention using drugs such as low molecular weight heparin or direct oral anticoagulants, or, 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 or both mechanical um, intervention, which is pr clot prevention using mechanical devices such as anti-embolic stockings or intermittent pneumatic compression. So pharmacological prophylaxis, the drugs include low molecular weight heparin, Fondaparinox in some cases, DOAX, direct oral anticoagulants, and these will include drugs uh, including apixaban, dabigatran, and rivagroxaban in elective hip and knee surgery, and aspirin only in elective hip and knee replacement. NICE states that in people under 16, health professionals should follow the recommendations on apixaban, dabigatran, and rivaroxaban, fondaparinox, low molecular heparin, and aspirin. So it's very important to check the SNPCs on your drug that you are using. Missed doses are a problem um, on wards, and we need to address these. It's important that all doses are prescribed and that there are no unnecessary omissions. Timings of doses should be exact to ensure patients have therapeutic cover over a whole 24-hour period. Any missed doses should be recorded with the reason clearly stated. Missed doses should be followed up and, if appropriate, the correct dose given as soon as possible. A missed dose could lead to hospital-acquired thrombosis, so it's particularly important that we, know, we appreciate this. Um, root cause analysis is required for all cases of HAT, and the evidence shows that a lot of them are as a result of missed doses. Mechanical prophylaxis, this is when you are thinking about anti-embolic stockings or intermittent pneumatic compression, and that's what NICE includes in their options for mechanical thromboprophylaxis. NICE also includes general steps to reduce venous thromboembolism 
embolism risk and that's to encourage people to mobilize as soon as possible and not to allow patients to become dehydrated unless clinically indicated. Whilst most thromboprophylaxis takes place in hospital whilst the patient is staying on the ward, there are specific patients who should have extended um, thromboprophylaxis. So when they go home from hospital. And NICE has got very specific guidelines for these, so you should look at them. Um, they would include patients with lower limb immobilization, fractures of the pelvis, hip, and proximal fe femur, elective hip and knee surgery, foot and ankle orthopedic surgery, elective spinal surgery, cranial surgery and spinal injury, and major cancer surgery of the abdomen and pelvis. Pregnant women pre and postnatally are linked to the green top guidance, and it's very important that those are followed. And there are instances when extended thromboprophylaxis is important for, for women who are pregnant or have just delivered. So the final step, step four, is patient education. And it's really a really central part of the prevention of hospital acquired thrombosis. So when should that education take place? Well, NICE says that should be on admission and as part of the discharge process. And how are we going to do that? Well, it should be both written and verbal. So we need to be talking to our patients and explaining the information about the prevention of hospital acquired thrombosis to them, but they also need a written backup. And the reason we do this is because evidence suggests that the information is retained better. And also you have this little uh, something that you can refer to when, um, when the, the, the nurse or who, who is telling you the information has, has gone away. And what should we include? Well, patients need to understand what VTE is and what to look for in case they have a recurrence. They also need to know how to administer their low molecular weight heparin if they're discharge taking it. And we're going to talk about a little bit more about information on discharge in another film. With regard to who should be doing this, you need to know what your protocol says about who is responsible for this process and ensuring that it's documented. Um, and it might be a, a different member of the healthcare team um, at different points. So it might be a doctor on admission, it might be a nurse or a pharmacist on discharge. So what specific information do you need on admission? Well, NICE says that the verbal and written information should be provided on the risks and possible consequences of VTE, the importance of VTE prophylaxis and its possible side effects, the correct use of the VTE pro prophylaxis. So for example, if you have anti-embolic stockings, you should know how to put them on, take them off, how to care for them. Uh, that, that sort of in, information and how you can reduce the risk yourself, such as keeping well hydrated and if possible, exercising and becoming more mobile. We know that information on admission is not done terribly well. And one of the problems with this is that the patient is very unwell. It might be an emergency admission and they're just not in a position to absorb that information. When we did a survey with the National Nursing and Midwifery Network, we found that the information given to patients on admission was very poor. We've done that survey twice and both times it came back with that result. And then on discharge, patients need to know the signs and symptoms of deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism so that if they're, if they're having another event, they can report this. They need to know the correct and recommended duration and, and of the use of the VTE pro, prophylaxis at home if they're discharged with it. They need to understand the importance of using VTE prophylaxis correctly and continuing the treatment for as long as it's recommended. They also need to understand the signs and symptoms of any adverse events related to that prophylaxis and the importance of, of seeking help and knowing who to contact if they have any problems with using that prophylaxis. And also the importance of seeking medical help if the deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism or other adverse events are suspected. So they need to know what the red flags are. 
hopefully patients will be in a better position to receive this message than at the point of admission. Uh, but you also need to check the resources that you have available to support this education because people are given a lot of information at the time of discharge. So you want to make sure that they have something that's going to be useful to them. And one of the good places that you can go to is the Thrombosis UK website because there is a little a nice series of information that patients that will be able to look at there. NICE has produced a quality standard for the for venous thromboembolism in, in adults. It was published in 2021, which and it is an update on the standards that were originally published separately for prevention of thrombosis and the treatment and management of thrombosis. When we look at these five standards, we can see that standard one and standard two relate to the prevention of hospital acquired thrombosis. So standard one states that people aged 16 and over who are in hospital and assessed as needing pharmacological venous thromboembolism prophylaxis started as soon as possible and within four 14 hours of a hospital admission. The second one states that people aged 16 and over who are discharged with a lower limb immobilization are assessed to identify their risk of venous thromboembolism. And the other three relate to the treatment and management of VTE. So throughout this the short film we've produced a, um, a, a, a used a series of references in which you can see here. There are also some learning resources that you can refer to. And um, I would strongly recommend that you go and look at the, the, the short films relating to the administration of low molecular weight heparin and those that link into uh, information for patients. I'd like to just add that the administration of low molecular weight happen on the wards is often rather badly done. If you work on a ward and all your patients have bruised tummies, then that is probably due to poor technique. So if you could look at that film, they, it will show you the correct way to do it. It's important to put the needle in at 90 degrees to the skin. It's important to keep the pit skin pinched um, until you actually remove the needle. And it's important that when you um, let go of the skin, you don't rub the um, injection site um, and you tell the patient not to scratch or itch the injection site because all of those things can cause that bad bruising that we often see as a result of poor practice. So I do stress, please watch the teaching patient to administer low molecular weight heparin video. And finally, we've included some quality improvement activities that you might like to undertake. And these are divided between the steps, really, in terms of risk assessment, thromboprophylaxis and patient education. So go and have a look to see where risk assessment is recorded in your hospital documentation and who is responsible for completing BT risk assessment. And then have a look and see what percent of patients are reassessed in that time with the NICE guidelines, because that reassessment is a really important part of the process of preventing hospital acquired thrombosis. With regard to thromboprophylaxis, you can go and have a look and see which type of low molecular weight heparin or a, a DOAC are used in your trust most commonly for thromboprophylaxis. And in relation to that, you might also want to look and see how are missed doses recorded and managed, because as we said earlier, that's another important factor in preventing hospital acquired thrombosis. And finally, go away and have a look and see what patient information leaflets you have. Have a look and see if they're easy to understand. And how do you evidence that patients are actually receiving that written and verbal information on admission and at discharge? And who is actually responsible for doing that? So next time in film four, we're going to look at how to ensure a safe discharge for patients prescribed anticoagulation from the hospital into the community. Look forward to seeing you then. Goodbye. <laughs>